Hello everyone. Welcome back after spring break. Although I'm sure most of you were not able to enjoy spring break because what of because what's going on right now. You know, we are all um stuck at home and I hope all of you are doing well. Um uh, you know, make sure you stay home, stay careful and you know, you practice social distancing. um because that's that's all what we can do right now we don't have any vaccine or for coronavirus we don't have any treatment but the only thing we can do is stay home and stay vigilant so that we can prevent this disease from spreading but having said that you know we still have to continue with our course and um as you have seen my emails um in the past week or so that we will be transitioning into an online course now so at the beginning of every week most likely end of monday or on tuesday i will send out an email with video lectures you know there will be two youtube links with the le- covering each lectures and that will also um, include you know basically i will be doing the examples and uh, just how i did it in class but it will be all on the video now i will also attach the lecture slides that we are covering in that week and i will also include any assignments um that you need to submit in that week or that that i assign that week and when it is due at the same time the mid term was supposed to be held on march 31st but if you have looked at the updated syllabus and also my announcement the mid term has been pushed to april 6th which is the april 7th which is a tuesday and this and now that we have transitioned into a online class the mid term exam will be an online class, uh, online um, exam and it will be all multiple choice questions uh so basically you know uh, there will be 35 multiple choice questions and you have to answer all those and all of those are based on the uh, examples i do in class as well as the lecture slides so um if you are having troubles understanding the lectures understanding accessing the videos or understanding the videos email me about specific topics that you want more explanations on or you know specific examples you need more clarifications on if needed we can get on a call to explain um you what's going on and uh, you know i'm here to help you so let's try to work together and make sure you check your dccd email the richland email all the time i do not have your gmail or your yahoo mail or other your other personal accounts and we are uh, officially required to, to communicate with the students through dccd emails so make sure you um, respond to that please and you check your emails properly okay so having said that we still have to continue with our course and uh, you know uh, basically in mid term 2 uh, the lectures that are covered are from lecture 5 to lecture 11 and today we will be starting or discussing lecture 10 in this video okay so lecture 10 talks about what are the market structures in the economy you know in a ca- in a capitalistic society such as the us what are the different market structures and specifically we will talk about perfect competition or pure competition as a market structure how this how this operates even in our next lecture we will continue in about perfect competition and um you know that's lecture 11 and that's that will be it for your mid term 2 after mid term 2 we will learn about the other three types of market structure which is monopoly monopolistic and oligopoly but for now you have to know what these structures mean and what and all the details about perfect competition or pure competition okay so in if you look at slide 2 of this lecture under capitalism or under a capitalistic society there are basically four types of broad market structures or four types of economies or four types of industries in this economy okay so the first one is called perfect competition or pure competition so perfect competition we will know a whole lot of details but what it basically means there is a lot of buyers lot of sellers and the products that are sold in this market are identical to one another so let's say me and patrick and um, uh, diego are um, three sellers in the uh, in this market and we will all sell the identical products in the market an example would be agricultural market again if you think about the cabbage market or the carrot market 
my carrot will not be many will not be different than what um, Patrick is selling within the, the what's Patrick's characters they are homogeneous so that's perfect competition and in a bit we are going to learn more about this then we have the monopoly market structure monopoly market structure is a, is, is a type of industry in which there is only one supplier let's say um, in Dallas just as an example let's say in the city of Dallas uh, you know, CoServ is the only electric company that provides, um, uh, you know, utility, electric utility to the people. You know, so that's an example of monopoly. People do not have any other options to go to. That's the only supplier they have and that they basically charge, you know, they basically charge a price and they have influence on the price. Okay. Then we have monopolistic market structure. A monopolistic market structure is very close to a pure or perfect competition. Um, there are a large number of buyers. There are a large number of sellers. But the only difference is in this type of market structure, the products are differentiated. They are not identical. They are not identical. They are differentiated. So what I am selling is different compared to what Patrick is selling. An example would be a restaurant industry. Okay, so there are so many let's say in the dallas market there are so many restaurants so there there's, there's a lot of sellers there's a lot of restaurant owners out there but at the same time all of us go to restaurants right so there, there's a lot of buyers also but the only difference between the restaurants is their products are differentiated right we have chinese restaurants versus mexican restaurants versus american restaurants versus thai restaurants so the cuisine they differentiate the product um, in such a way and that that's how they are different in the, that's that's the type of market structure so restaurant industry um, uh, would be an example of monopolistic market structure and finally we have oligopoly market structure this is the type of market structure we have a lot of buyers but there are only a couple of uh, um, suppliers maybe 10 to 12 or maybe 5 to 6 suppliers in the market not one if you have one that's a monopoly but under oligopoly there's only few suppliers and so they have some influence on the price in the airline industry the airline industry would be an example of oligopoly the telephone industry you know AT&T Verizon Sprint T-Mobile Metro PCS so there's a couple of suppliers so that would be an example of oligopoly market structure but we will learn in detail each of these chapters in this in lecture 10 and 11 we are going to talk about perfect competition and then after the midterm we will learn specifically about monopoly monopolistic and oligopoly um, in order to see how the cost and revenue relationships are and which one is more efficient um, and you know based on that we we get a lot of information that helps us to identify or classify each of the industries in today's world um, and make good economic decisions okay so pure competition um, is basically it's a unique market structure there is no perfect example of pure competition in today's world I, when I said agricultural market that's the closest possible um, example of pure competition or perfect competition okay so it's not it's it's a unique type of market structure and it provides output at the very lowest cost so producers produce the output at the lowest cost over the long run okay and there are a couple of characteristics of perfect competition first of all there is a large number of buyers and large number of sellers in the market okay again think about the cabbage market there are a lot of producers of cabbage and at the same time most of us will buy cabbage and that's probably part of our diet and we will buy cabbage at some point um, in the month or in two months we'll always buy cabbage and then there's always going to be a lot of suppliers so there's a large number of buyers large number of sellers and then each individual person or each individual buyer or individual seller cannot influence the price let's say me, Patrick, Diego, Fernanda, we are all producers of cabbage. Now, if you know, if the market price is three dollars and I am charging like all three of the all all the three other suppliers are charging three dollars and I'm charging four dollars, nobody's gonna come to me. All the buyers will go to her because our products, you know, there's we don't have any influence on price. On the same way the buyers do not have any influence on the price so there's a large number of buyers there's a large number of sellers and nobody has influence on the price and the reason for that is because the products are homogeneous right 
So because my product and Fernandez products and uh, Patrick's products are exactly the same, we cannot charge higher prices um, because then buyers will just switch to the other uh, supplier. So the products in this type of market are homogeneous or identical, you know, like the agricultural market, or even if you think about the stock exchange, the stocks are identical. So these are examples. Um, this is another characteristic. So first characteristic is large number of buyers and sellers. Second is the products are homogeneous or identical and buyers and sellers do not have any um, control over price, any individual. Now, as a group, we might have control, but as an individual supplier or as an individual buyer, we do not have any influence on the price. Okay, the third characteristic is buyers and sellers in the market will act to maximize their economic benefit in this type of market structures and in any type of market structure. That's true. You know, buyers will, will want to purchase at the lowest price and sellers will want to sell at the highest um, price. So that's that's another it's, it's a it's structure. It's, it's applicable for all types of market structure. And finally, another unique characteristic of perfect competition is that the entry and exit into the market is very low the barriers to entry or exit to the market is very low so let's say if i today i want to enter into the cabbage market i can easily produce cabbage in my garden and sell it into the market it's very easy to enter the market anytime i want to stop selling cabbage I can just get out of the market there are so many suppliers there won't be any shortage people will people still have a lot of options to go to in order to buy cabbage right so the barriers to entry into this type of industry or market is very low as well as the barriers to exit this type of market is very low so these are the characteristics of perfect competition: large number of buyers and sellers products are identical and homogeneous producers and buyers uh, as an individual does not have influence on the price buyers will act to maximize their benefit producers will also act to maximize their benefit and uh, the last characteristic is that the barriers to entry or exit into this type of market structure is very low so pure competition is also known as perfect competition these are basically same thing we use interchangeably sometimes you will see I'm saying perfect competition or sometimes I'm saying pure competition but it basically means the same thing okay so one thing the pure competition and pure or pure competition or perfect competition um, assumes is that there is perfect information in the market so what does this mean this means that all the information about the market are available to the suppliers and to the buyers so it's a transparent there's nothing hidden we all know with the buyers know that you know that's the market price for cabbage and there's a lot of suppliers um, so if someone is trying to charge higher they have the knowledge that they can switch to some other supplier you know so the all the knowledge about the market is available to the buyers as well as the sellers so, so there is perfect information there is a complete transparency there is no hidden information in this type of industry now this type of market structure also assumes that there is perfect mobility of goods and services what that means is that goods and services can be delivered to any parts of the world there is no problems with delivery you know it can be easily accessed by everyone and uh, you know everyone can Get, have access to this type of products or in the in this type of market structure okay so you know we say that the stock exchange market or the agriculture market are examples of pure competition but to be honest this is the uh, the type of market structure that's closest to perfect competition like even in uh, agricultural market government provides subsidies uh, in the stock exchange market government regulates a lot of things under uh, under an ideal perfect competition structure or under an ideal pure competition the market will self-regulate itself without any type of government there won't be any government interaction there will be a lot of competition among the suppliers buyers uh, will also interact in the market and there will be no government intervention um, so in reality we don't really have a perfect example of pure competition but we can say agricultural market 
um, you know, is very close to this type of market structure because there is a large number of buyers and sellers. There is perfect information to the people, and um, then the products are also identical, and the barriers to entry and exit are also very low. There's probably some government regulation that that's why it's probably not 100% a pure competition market or pure competitive market structure. So pure competition or perfect competition is very important when we are studying the different types of market structures for various industries, let's say for airline industry, for uh, telephone industry, for manufacturing industry. It's very important we understand what pure competition is. It's kind of like the benchmark. This is where, where this is the point where all the industries should be at. It is the benchmark which economists use and they can basically compare the other types of market structures. So the, the different things that we have to know about perfect competition or the reason why it is most important is because number one, it is the type of market structure that offers the lowest price. So the products have the lowest price and at the same time, consumer's responsiveness is most. So consumer satisfaction is maximized in this type of market structure. Prices are lowest and cost is also lowest. So both sides are benefited. Suppliers have lowest cost. Buyers pay lowest prices. So customer satisfaction is maximized and also producer is more efficient. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, it is also very easy to understand. The relationship between um, revenue and cost is very easy to understand. And we will look at a graph and example today to see that. But it's very easy to understand. And we can compare these graphs to other market structures and see where they are at and how different they are at. And finally, since producer is producing at the minimum cost, they are productively efficient. And since customers are most responsive and they're satisfaction is maximized then it is also allocative efficient, allocatively efficient so that means a perfectly competitive structure or a pure competition market structure is both productively e efficient and allocatively efficient so these are the three reasons why this is important because this is the benchmark this is the ideal situation we want to have in this case it is the most efficient type of market structure we have efficiency from the consumer side as well as efficiency from the producers so it's the, it's the best case scenario for a type of economy okay so if, you know in a in a perfectly competitive industry let's say the cabbage market industry we all we have a downward sloping demand curve and that supply curve is almost upward sloping so the demand curve when we look at the demand curve of the industry it's basically a combination of demand curves for all the buyers in the market and the supply curve is a combination of all the supply curves of the all the producers in the market so if you look at the graph let's see if you look at the graph So let's say this is quantity, this is price, okay. So here it's saying the demand curve is downward sloping, we know, and the supply curve is upward sloping, we also know that, right? So what it's saying, this demand curve of the agricultural market represents the demand of all the buyers in the market. It's the combination of all the demand of the buyers. And the supply curve of the industry, this is for the industry, Uh, let me redo it quickly. So you better so, so for the industry, we have demand and supply. And let's say this is for the industry. Okay, so it's basically combination of all the de demand is the combination of all the buyers supply is the combination of all the suppliers and no single buyer has influence on the market price. And in this case, the market equilibrium is here okay so that's the market equilibrium that's the price that's the equilibrium price that's the equilibrium quantity okay in this type of market structure there is no shortage there is no surplus and no individual supplier or no individual buyer um, can influence the price if so if the market if in the market we know the price of cabbage is three dollars then I as an individual supplier cannot just go and charge four dollars 
So what does that mean in terms of an individual firm? So if we look at the demand curve for one single firm, this is for the industry, this is for the industry, and this is for one firm in the industry. So let's say I operate in the cabbage industry, and this is my demand curve. I'm the firm, and what is my demand curve? So my demand curve will be perfectly elastic or a horizontal demand curve. This is my demand curve because the price, I cannot charge a price greater than P. I cannot charge a price less than P. Whatever the market price is has been dictated, I have to accept that because look at it in this way. This is my demand curve. Let's say if I'm charging $3 is, the, let's say, assume $3 is the equilibrium price, and I'm also charging equilibrium price $3, so people will still buy, you know. If I increase my quantity, people will still buy. But let's say if I increase my price to $4, then nobody will buy, my, buy from me. They will just switch to the other suppliers in the market because there are so many other suppliers selling the same identical product so they will just not buy anything at all from me. So it will not make sense. And also, I will not sell at $2. Remember, in a perfect industry or perfectly competitive industry or in a pure competition, in a pure competition, we do not, we cannot influence the price and the producers are operating at the lowest cost, right? So producers are operating at this lowest cost. So if I am charging a price of $2, I am probably charging a price less than the cost that I incurred. So in this case, it will not make any rational explanation. It's, it's not logical for me to charge a price $2 when my cost is actually more than $2 right so so whatever the market dictates whatever the equilibrium is in the market that will be the price for that firm and my the demand curve for each individual firm in the market will be a horizontal demand curve if we charge more than the price then all the we will lose all the consumers they will just switch to other supplies if we charge less than the market price it does not logically make sense to us because we are going to be making losses. So there's no point in running the business. So going back to the slide, the equilibrium or the market clearing price and quantity is where the total demand and total supply are equal. So you have to remember like, for the industry as a whole, the demand curve will be downward sloping. But when we look at a specific firm or a specific seller in that market structure, uh, in the perfect competition market structure, then the demand curve will be horizontal because we don't have any influence on the price. Then let me do an example and then um, try to derive some more relationships in a perfect competition world okay so uh, let's say we are given with this table we have price we have quantity we have total revenue we have average revenue we have marginal revenue okay so right now we are looking at the revenue side of the firm um, in the next lecture, which is next, um, you know, lecture 11, we will talk about the cost side of firms in the perfectly competition market. But this is basically the revenue side. Okay, so we are talking about the revenue side here of a perfect competition firm. Okay, so let's say we know that the price will always remain $3 for us. We cannot charge more than $3. But the way we can increase our revenue is by increasing our quantity because we can sell, if you remember this graph, for a firm, that's the demand curve, and that's $3. You cannot change the price, but you can increase the, dem uh, increase the quantity that will help you to make more revenue, right? So let's say you sell 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. 
okay so if you're selling zero units and the price is three dollars what's the total revenue you're not selling anything at all so your total revenue is zero your average revenue is zero your marginal revenue there's no marginal revenue because you're just not selling anything now let's say you move to this next point your price still remains the same because remember the demand curve is horizontal we don't have any influence on the price so price still remains the same but now i sell one unit so my total revenue will be price times quantity which is three right because it's price times quantity then my average revenue will be three three divided by one which is basically my total revenue divided by quantity which is three and my marginal revenue in this case when I am producing from 0 to 1 unit by how much is the total revenue increasing total revenue is increasing by three dollars so the additional revenue that I'm making by selling one additional unit is three dollars okay now let's look at the second one if I'm selling two units at three dollars then my total revenue is six dollars my average revenue is basically total revenue divided by quantity so 6 divided by 2 equals 3 and then if we look at the marginal revenue which is the change in total revenue when we increase the output by one unit so let's say when we are selling um, from one unit to two units by how much did the revenue go up it went up by another three dollars okay again if we look at this the total revenue is nine dollars which is three times three is nine average revenue is basically your total revenue divided by quantity which is three and your change in revenue or your marginal revenue when you are selling three units versus two units the difference in revenue because of that one additional increase in output is three dollars okay and then finally let's say when we are selling four units we are making twelve dollars in total revenue and then our average revenue is again twelve divided by four is three and when we increase one additional unit from three to four the extra revenue that we are making is also three dollars okay so this is for a perfectly competitive market the price does not change so price remains the same because we don't have any influence on the market if we increase the price we will lose all our customers so the only way we can make more money is by increasing the quantity and that's how when we are increasing the quantity the total revenue is going up now one thing if you notice here let me write it here If you notice from here, your price, the price is equal to your average revenue, which is equal to marginal revenue, which is equal to $3. If you look at each and every point, your price is $3 your average revenue is three dollar your marginal revenue is three dollars your price is three dollar your average is three dollars average revenue is three dollars marginal revenue is three dollars when your price is three dollars your average revenue is three dollar here your marginal revenue is three dollar here so even if you are selling more per unit the average revenue you are making is the same and the additional revenue that you are making is also the same so under a perfectly competitive market we will always have price is equal to average revenue is equal to your marginal revenue so in this case we can write p equals ar equals mr okay so this is the one of the important conditions of um, the perfectly competitive market structure so in a perfectly competitive market structure when we look at the revenue relationships we will know that the price will be always equal to your average revenue and average revenue or it will always be equal to your marginal revenue because the price does not change so that's the revenue side um, next class we will look into the lecture side but I wanted to give you a um, reminder of what the costs are we have to know what variable cost is variable cost is basically the more we produce 
the more we incur of these expenses okay so these are directly proportional to the amount of output let's say when a manufacturer increases output there will be increased cost for these items you know let's say we we, we if we are a cabbage producer and we, we are producing more and more cabbage we will need more seeds we will need more um, fertilizers we will need more labor we will need more water so the cost for labor the cost for fertilizer the cost for water these are all examples of variable cost you know, and fixed cost is a cost that does not change with your output right remember like paying rent or let's say you know paying insurance they do not depend on the level of your output or activity so those are fixed costs and one last uh, uh, top, one last um, item that uh, this slide talks about is average cost is basically your total cost divided by the total number of goods that you're producing. The reason why I'm talking about variable cost, fixed cost and average cost is because in the next lecture we will discuss in details about these costs for firms in a perfectly competition market and then we will compare this average revenue, marginal revenue to your average cost, marginal cost, and variable cost, and see how farms in this type of market structure can make profit and stay in business. So I will continue um, in my next lecture about perfect competition and wrap it up before we um, you know, talk about the midterm. But for now, that, that is it. For this lecture, that's it. So we will continue in the next lecture. Thank you.